Okay. Uh, last video, we started talking about wind corrections. We took a brief look at the clock method. We introduced you to that. And the clock method, we talked about how crosswinds will have a full value, which means that you're going to have a wind corrections uh, table, and uh, that'll give you a given amount of correction to apply for like a 10 mile an hour wind. And if the, the crosswind is directly coming from the side, a 90 degree crosswind, you'll apply that full value onto your optic. We also talked about how there are zones uh, where if the wind is kind of coming at a quartering angle, it's not going to be the full value. And according to the clock system, you would place a half value correction, which means that uh, if you have, a, let's say, a wind coming from 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock, somewhere in that half value zone, you would simply apply half of the recommended correction for a 10 mile an hour wind. We did uh, hint that this clock method will not be appropriate for long and extreme range applications, that this is really designed for battlefield snipers who are operating within 800 meters. Uh, so we're going to uh, look into more detail on that in just a minute. We're going to look at some examples of how much wind is actually going to push a projectile. We also talked about when we're considering our clock method that a wind coming from straight in front of you or straight behind you, you're not going to place any horizontal value corrections on your optic because it's not obviously not going to be pushing your bullet right or left that much. You will have a, a increased drag if you do have a headwind because the wind's blowing against the bullet and that'll cause your point of impact to be lower because it's going to slow your bullet down quicker. Uh, we also talked about how a tailwind will do the opposite. If you have the air mass moving along with the projectile, that equals less drag on your, your bullet, and therefore your bullet will have a little bit higher of a strike. So let's take a look here in this video and uh, look at some examples again and see by how much this really affects bullet flight. How much wind does it really take to throw you off? And this will give you a good idea of... Uh, how important correcting for wind is. And uh, then we're going to also discuss temperature variations. We, we briefly mentioned that in our last video, but we talked about how a warm wind, we talked about before with uh, you know temperature uh, corrections and stuff, that warm air is less dense than cold air. So a warm wind is going to deflect the bullet less than a cold wind will because the air is a lot thicker when it's colder. So that's going to have a lot more influence on your bullet strike if you have a cold wind. So by how much? Well, we'll show you some examples here in just a minute. We're also going to go over in this video uh, a different version for wind direction determination and value hold off rather than the clock method, which uh, is rather imprecise and it's actually incorrect in how it assumes just a half value for everything. Uh, we're going to show you uh, a, the protractor method. We're going to use angle cosines. We'll show you how that works. And then we'll briefly discuss downslope uh, breezes, upslope breezes, uh, wind trends throughout the day. And uh, we'll look at uh, some other examples of some other complications that may happen and other things that you do want to consider uh, when you're doing long-range shots. So first, let's start off by just looking at some examples. Let's uh, take a look at this uh, picture of the deer we have again. We have the big old muley buck. And our range, again, just for sake of comparison for all these different things, is 1,000 meters. And we'll use the same 308 card we've been using in the last few videos just to keep it consistent for you. We're going to use the 168 grain boat tail hollow point going at uh, 2,600 feet a second, okay? And uh, let's take a look at the range cards here. So I, I need to explain something here before we get going. So this is uh, the different wind corrections for a 10 mile an hour crosswind. This would be a full value. So this is assuming you have a direct crosswind. So you would apply all of the correction for a 10 mile an hour crosswind. And uh, we have our range on the left column. And then we have our elevation setting. That's uh, the drop, right? That's what you're going to dial in on your elevation. And then we have the uh, wind angle. We have a 90 degree wind angle. That's a direct crosswind. That's how much uh, uh, you would dial in on your windage knob, okay? And this is in minutes of angle for, th for this video here. And then the zero degrees wind angle, that's talking about a direct headwind. That's a 12 o'clock headwind, okay? And the 180 degrees, that would be behind you. That'd be a six o'clock wind, okay? So that's uh, defining what's going on here. These three separate cards, the one on the, the left is a 30 degrees Fahrenheit air temperature. The one in the middle is more standard conditions, so-called. 
at a 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and the one on the right is an example of kind of a hot uh, weather card, which is a 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're going to compare and see how much difference we have in our wind corrections for a 10 mile an hour wind. And if you look here at these columns, you're going to notice that uh, the differences are significant. Let's look at 1,000 meters on the card, and you're going to see that at 1,000 meters, a 90 degree wind or a direct crosswind uh, is going to have a one minute difference between 30 degrees Fahrenheit and 60 degrees Fahrenheit. The, the 30 degrees colder wind uh, deflected the bullet a full minute of angle more than the 60 degrees one. So that's about 10 or 11 inches at 1,000 meters, okay? And you'll see how it was, again, another minute of angle deflection for another 30 degrees at 1,000 meters. And you'll see, you can look at the different ranges here to compare and contrast as well. And you'll see how the deflection up and down for shooting into a headwind and uh, shooting away from a tailwind is going to basically um, have a much smaller effect on the bullet than did your uh, crosswind. And the deflection is not left and right in these cases. It's uh, up and down because you're shooting into a headwind. It's going to, you're going to have to, it's going to cause your strike to be lower. So you're going to have to crank it up uh, on your knob. So that's what the up means. And if you're shooting, uh, you know, with the tailwind behind you, that's going to cause your strike to be higher. So you're going to have to move your optic down. So that's what those uh, things in the columns mean there. So this is an example of a generic range card for given temperature. So let's go ahead and look at uh, what this would translate to out there in the real world. Okay, so here's our uh, mule deer buck standing at 1,000 meters. It's not moving around. And in this case, we're just going to look at a 10-mile-an-hour crosswind. So a full, directly 90 degrees, we'll say the wind is coming from your left. So it's a, it's a 9 o'clock wind, means it's coming from your left and going towards your right. So you're, it's going to push your bullet to the right. Now, in these examples, we're going to assume that we have already corrected for our spin drift and our Coriolis effect, uh, which would actually push the bullet to the right as well. So this is only the effects of the wind. We have already corrected for spin drift and Coriolis in these examples. So let's see what a 10-mile-an-hour wind would look like. How far is that going to push you? Is it going to cause you to actually miss the entire animal? Well, let's, all right, we take a shot and... Uh, nothing. I mean, you didn't even hit anywhere on this uh, screen. You actually hit about four mils to the right. So you missed by 13.7 minutes of angle. That's just a 10 mile an hour crosswind. That's really not even that much, especially for up here. I mean, we get 25 and 35 mile an hour winds all the time up here. So as you can see, just a 10 mile an hour wind threw you off by several uh, full body lengths of the deer. That would have been a, a severe miss if you wouldn't have corrected for it. So let's uh, reduce this wind speed now. Let's, uh, let's say just a three mile an hour crosswind. What would that look like at 1,000 meters with our, with our 308 that we're talking about here? So if, if you have a three mile an hour crosswind, again, coming from the 9 o'clock, going towards your 3 o'clock, and you take a shot, how far is that going to throw you? Now... Keep in mind, a three-mile-an-hour crosswind is almost impossible to detect by feel. You can just barely maybe feel it on, on the side of your face. I mean, it, it's so light that, you know, maybe smoke will drift a little bit, but uh, it's not going to even cause that much of a disturbance in the ve vegetation. Most people would consider three miles an hour to be pretty much dead calm. So how much would a three-mile-an-hour wind throw you off? Okay, so that would be... Uh, how much it would throw you off. And in the red dot, what we're going to do here is separate this out by uh, temperature. So this is if we have an ambient air temperature of 90 degrees. That's that card all the way on the right that we're looking at. So this is a, a, a small wind deflection compared to the colder one. So let's look at the cold one. If we have uh, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the air is obviously thicker and the same 10 mile or the same three mile per hour crosswind in this case, this is only three miles per hour, is going to push you off by this much. Okay, so that was a noticeably different. Um, let's take a look at 60. So 60 would be right in between those. So those are your three different points of impact for a three mile an hour crosswind. Now, if we're looking at the 10 mile an hour crosswind, though, those would even be spaced a little farther apart because uh, it would all be amplified out there. So this is quite a large amount of uh, difference, actually, talking about uh, the two different temperature ranges from uh, 30 degrees to 90 degrees. 
the air does change it. And uh, this is only a thousand meters. If you're shooting even farther than that, and uh, in the case of a deer, your uh, the, your target is distributed like spatially horizontally because it's long, right? So you have a little bit of leeway with the deer, especially the way he's standing at this angle to where you, if you miss to the right, you're still going to sort of hit it, but that's not going to be very good. You're going to want to correct for your temperature is what we're getting at here. Now, if you're shooting extreme range, that's going to even be worse. If you're shooting at 1,500 meters, you're going to see even more drastic change between the different ambient air temperatures. Now, another thing I have to mention here as well is that when we're comparing these um, wind deflections for these different temperatures, I actually left the muzzle velocity as a constant just so we can compare the external trajectories, okay? I did not uh, allow this to adjust for the changes in internal ballistics, which would uh, throw off your muzzle velocity. In reality, these are going to be even more magnified because in hot temperatures, your, uh, your muzzle velocity is going to be higher due to your ammunition burn rates. So uh, basically, that red dot would have hit further to the, to the left. It would have been closer. It would have been less deflected. And your cold shot, the blue one there, uh, your, your burn rate would have been slower, so your muzzle velocity would have been lower, and that would have caused you to miss even more to the right. So these would be even more amplified if we were actually correcting for internal ballistics changes due to ammo temperature. But just for the sake of uh, scientifically comparing the differences just externally, um, we, we, I left all the muzzle velocities at 2,600 feet a second. But in reality, it would be even more distributed. So... Let's take a look at, all right, what about vertical distribution? Let's say we're shooting into a headwind, okay? The wind's coming straight at you. Now, uh, this is a 10-mile-an-hour wind this time. The last time we were looking at was only a 3-mile-per-hour crosswind. Uh, but let, now let's crank it back up to 10. So we take a shot into a headwind without correcting for our headwind. And we're going to miss just below the vitals. So here you can see how the shape of your target really... Uh, determines how effective you're going to be with uh, these different corrections. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, you got a, a target that's uh, distributed more vertically. Like if you're shooting at, if HTI team is engaging like a missile standing straight up, you're going to have a lot of uh, forgiveness up and down, but laterally it's going to be a narrow target. Or like a, even a human target for military applications is going to be taller than it is wide. So uh, that does affect the dynamics of how fussy you want to be with these corrections. But for our I would strongly recommend correcting for everything all the time, though, because there's enough factors that are going to throw you off anyways. You don't need them to all add up and have a huge sum total of, uh, you know, being off. That's not going to help you, your game, very well. So here's what it looked like for that. Let's uh, look at the real hot temperature. That was the 60 degrees. Here's the 90-degree deflection. Now, it's you can see they're very close to each other. Uh, you do miss below below the chest, though. So if you don't correct for a 10-mile-an-hour nose wind coming straight at you, that's what's going to happen. You're going to miss a deer uh, low. It's going to graze the bottom of them. It's not going to be lethal. So you do want to account for that. Let's take a look at a, a tiny breeze again, a 3-mile-an-hour headwind, just barely noticeable. Okay, if we look at the 3-mile-an-hour, they all pretty much stack up basically in the same place uh, depending on temperature. But uh, it will cause your, your bullet strike to be a tiny bit low. You're still going to hit the shoulder, but it is going to change your point of impact. So your vitals, depending on how they're distributed in the particular target you're shooting at, uh, this is going to cause you to hit a little bit different than where you're aiming. So it's something that you do want to correct for. Even with a 3-mile-an-hour wind, if you have the time, you just want to correct for everything. So let's take a look at what it would look like if we had a 10-mile-an-hour tailwind that we didn't correct for. So a tailwind means the air mass is moving along with your projectile. So it's going to have less drag on the front of the bullet, obviously, and that'll cause you to strike high. By how much? By about this much. You're going to just miss over the top. So this is uh, what, what we're illustrating here is that there's a lot of factors a lot of guys don't even think about. Uh, you figure that you only have to adjust for wind if it's laterally coming, if it's a crosswind. And that no value zone that the clock system showed us is really not... Uh, the best way to do that, it, that's deceiving. There really is a value. It's just a vertical value. And uh, a 10-mile-an-hour wind would have caused a miss over the top of this deer if you didn't correct for it. A lot of guys, when they miss, 
they might think, oh, there must have been an angle difference or they must have measured something wrong or their scope wiggled. or there, there, There's a lot of misdiagnosis of uh, misses. <laughs> so you, you really want to account for all these factors, especially by looking at how much we miss by on these different things. You can see uh, how important the details are. So you definitely want to correct for all those things. Let's take a look. Uh, now, we discussed in our clock method there, if you if we look at the clock again, let's say we have a quartering wind coming at approximately 45-degree angle, okay? We'll say in this case it's coming from like 730, okay? So uh, from behind us and to the left, and it's blowing kind of over our shoulder and going forward and to the right of us. Um, the clock method would suggest that if we have a wind coming from that kind of a direction, we would simply take a half value approach, okay? Because that's, that's a direct 45-degree angle. So half of the, the hold-off value. So if we look at our uh, card here for our wind corrections, let's just say we're looking at a 60-degree temperature. Uh, a 10-mile-an-hour crosswind would have a full correction value of 13.7 minutes of angle. Okay, that's what we would index under our optic. So according to the clock method, we would this is in the half value zone. So we're going to take the 13.7 minutes of angle and just give it half half of that. So divide by 2, that'd be 6.85 minutes of angle that we would adjust. And in this case, it's uh, pushing us to the right, so we're going to want to adjust to the left. Okay, so we're going to crank our scope to the left because it's pushing it to the right. we got to crank into the wind always. So we're just going to give it a half value correction. So we, we dial in our optic uh, 6.85 to the left. And uh, we're even going to give it a half value because we're halfway shooting away from the wind. So we sort of halfway have a tailwind. So we're going we're gonna to be smarter than the clock method even says. We're going to even apply our uh, half value for our uh, vertical deflection for a tailwind. So uh, the full vertical uh, value would have been 0 0.9 minutes of angle. We're going to cut that in half. We're going to dial in uh, 0.45 minutes. And here's an example of what we think intuitively it should look like uh, for that crosswind value. Okay, so if the clock system was accurate, this is where our uh, point of impact would look due to the crosswind. It's going to come up a little bit because it's sort of coming from behind us. So we applied half value, and we gave it half uh, value for the full crosswind. The full crosswind for 10 miles an hour, as we saw in the first example, would have pushed us way off the page over 4 mils. So this is half of four mils, okay? So, but the problem is here, and uh, what you can't really tell from looking at this picture, is that in reality, that's not how this works. Um, we're gonna, the clock method seems like it's uh, pretty intuitive. Like, if you have a, a, a halfways in between no value and full value, you would think that halfways between those would be half value, right? But in trigonometry, that's not really how you calculate the uh, horizontal value for the holdoff here. In reality, the, uh, the correction for a 45-degree angle would actually be about 70% of the full value. So you're going to have about 70% of the uh, actual full value crosswind here is what you would actually correct for. And that's just a trigonometry uh, problem. So if you're familiar with trigonometry, you can work this out in your triangles. And uh, it's it's not like you would think it would work out to be, but you have to use what they call cosines. And this is kind of similar to how we're going to calculate our angle of fire corrections on the next video, where we're talking about shooting up and downhill. Um, it's, the cosine is basically a trigonometry function that uh, you look at in a right angle triangle that's the ratio of length to the adjacent side of the hypotenuse of that triangle. So it's kind of like the sign of the complement. And that's how you truly figure out how much of that value you need to adjust for. Uh, so it's not like you'd think just by looking at it at a glance. You can't just apply a half value because it's halfways in between there. We're talking about a 360 degree. This is an angular deal, okay? So you have to use cosine. And uh, if uh, you don't know how to figure this out on paper, that's why we have the, uh, what do you call it, the scientific calculators we talked about in our uh, equipment selection, is all you simply have to do is type in 
the, there's a cosine button on those calculators. Most of them, all you do is you hit the cosine button, and then you hit your angle. So 45 degrees, and then hit enter. And that'll give you the percent of the hold off that you would you want to actually apply. So the cosine of 45 degrees is approximately 7.707. Uh, so that's about 70%. So you take your full wind value, which was 13.7 uh, minutes of angle, and instead of dividing by 2, it's, that would be taking it multiplied by 0.5. It's not 50% of that. It's going to be 70%. So we take our 13.7 minutes of angle times 0 0.7. And that'll actually give us a uh, correction of 9.6 minutes of angle as opposed to 6.85, which is a significant difference. Uh, so there's a, a big difference between the clock method and actually figuring this out using trigonometry. And uh, the trigonometry is going to give you a pretty much an exact uh, hold off. So your hold off would have actually been like 2.8 mils. And unfortunately, my picture isn't big enough here. It would be off to the right of the picture again. You wouldn't be able to see it because this is uh, two mils. So it would have been quite a bit more of a deflection that you'd have to adjust for than uh, the half, the half uh, value system on the clock method would have shown us. So when you're figuring out your windage angles, I would recommend kind of trashing the clock method and just uh, throwing that in the garbage can for now because we're going to be doing extreme range shooting. And even at medium and long range, it is significantly uh, still quite a bit a big difference. So it's something you probably would want to count for anyways. I mean, would you rather hit like nine inches off to the side of the bullseye or exactly on the bullseye for your windage? You might not miss the steel target, but you're going to be towards the edge. So, and there's there's enough possibility that you missed read the wind just enough anyways to where you want to eliminate any of the wiggle room that you could have just by being sloppy with your calculations. So when we're doing any of these calculations, always try to be as precise as possible. And uh, another thing that when we're talking about these wind deflections that might throw you off, I know it did for me, is uh, after I learned how to do all this mathematically, I always second guess myself. And uh, I would be looking at the target downrange, and there would be such a small wind. A lot of times I'd be shooting, it'd be like a five-mile-an-hour breeze that's kind of quartering at you. And uh, so it was a very, very small amount of actual crosswind value. And uh, the firing solution would uh, dictate that I would index quite a large correction on my optic. And it was like more than I thought it should be with my intuition, right? I'm like, eh, that seems like that's kind of too much. So I would always second guess my calculations and I'd kind of dial in what I thought I should and I'd always miss by exactly how much I adjusted for, which means that if I would have dialed in my optic exactly where my wind tables and my calculations that I scientifically figured out, you know, if I would have dialed that in just like I figured out, I would have nailed it exactly on the first shot. And so it took me a few years to get used to that and I was always second guessing, especially my wind because... It didn't seem like the wind could possibly push the bullet by that far. So I was always undercorrecting for the wind. Because a lot of times there was just real, real light breezes that you couldn't even feel. But the mirage downrange was indicating there was just a tiny bit of wind. And it would throw me off by a huge amount because I wasn't actually correcting for it. I'd always second guess it. So that's something you want to do. You want to practice just trust your calculations. Um... And you'll get a lot closer. Now, you, you're not always going to get this. This is something that's going to take a long time to get experience. Reading the wind, like we said before, is very, very difficult sometimes. And uh, But uh, you'll be surprised by how much a small breeze will actually push your projectile. So let's look at some of the other complications that we might have going on here, just so we can get, get an appreciation of how difficult this wind is to tackle. Uh, if you consider the different, there, if you're talking about uh, mountainous areas where you have hills and valleys or mountains and valleys, there are some effects that are probably noteworthy. And uh, let me find my picture here. Okay, so let's talk about upslope evening breezes. Now, during the daytime, what you have happen is you have uh, air that's at lower altitudes in valleys starts to heat up. And when the air heats up down in the valley, it expands and it becomes less dense. So just like a boat floats on water because of buoyancy, it's less dense, your air is going to rise. So your air is going to start floating up. So what you have is upslope breezes, and this happens in the daytime, as especially in the evening. 
is when they're the, they're the greatest usually. So you have your air start to move up slopes. So let's look at this picture here. And on the left, you see uh, the FFP. That's the final firing position. That's where the shooter is. And on the right, on the other side of the valley, you have the T. That's the target. Okay. So let's say you were going to shoot across this valley. And you'd figure out all your normal wind corrections based on your mirage. But you're going to also sometimes, especially when we're talking about shots like this, you're going to have a wind that's blowing straight up or down. It's not always on the horizontal plane. It's not always just left and right and front and back. It, it, the wind is a three-dimensional thing. It can be up and down as well. And so that's something. And these breezes can vary on their velocity. But that's another thing that you might have to account for. So uh, if you're uh, figuring out your firing solution and uh, you, it's the evening time and you do feel an upper draft, you, you do want to account for that in your firing solution just a little bit. Um, and that will happen on the periphery of the, the valleys usually too. It'll be usually going up the sides of the slope. So in the middle of this valley, up in the open air part, you might not have that much of an updraft uh, as you do against the slope. So in, when you start talking about rugged topography like mountains and hills, you have a lot of complications starting to come up and that can really complicate your shot and uh, this is grossly oversimplified picture of what's going on you're going to have all kinds of little eddies and local uh you know disturbances and you're going to have all kinds of little uh turbulences and micro variations going on that are really hard to, if we would draw a little arrow for each little side breeze going on this would be a mess of a picture so uh, that's something you need to consider. Let's look at the evening breezes. Uh, at, in the nighttime, your uh, mountain tops start to cool off, and the air is going to start cooling on the top, so that's going to basically create a heavier air density for that air up there, and it's going to fall down into the valleys. So you'll have downslope morning breezes, and usually these will be the strongest like right before dawn, in the, the late part of the, the dark hours of the night, uh, right before it starts getting light out, you're going to have a pretty good uh, downslope breeze. So that's something you want to be aware of. And, and this go, a lot of this goes into mission planning of your shot as well. Uh, you want to consider the daily cycles, the wind cycles in your area, and try to figure out if it's possible to uh, you know kind of calibrate your mission to where you can take a shot when the, the wind conditions are the most favorable or so you can be prepared to uh, correct for this in advance. So that all goes into mission planning as well. So let's take a look at uh, some other complications that can happen when we're doing long and extreme range shooting. And let's just consider a flat ground shot now. Just standard, uh, you know, relatively flat topography here. So we got our firing position on the left there. And we got our target straight across from us. We don't got any weird valleys or anything going on. Uh, just straight across from us at a long range. In your line of sight, you're going to be looking uh, right at your target with your optic. Your rifle will be elevated. And you, you can look at the trajectory curve here. And uh, it starts to drop off from the line of departure. And your max ordnance is uh, pretty high above your line of sight. And then it drops down into the bullet there on the descending leg of the trajectory. So that's what a standard you know, trajectory curve looks like. Now, of course, this is exaggerated, uh, the scale is, so that we can see see this more obviously. Now, uh, wh what most guys do for, uh, for long and extreme range shooting is uh, they'll take a reading of the wind at the final firing position where they're at, and they'll either use an anemometer to get an exact reading, or they'll use the field method or a flag method. They might have a range flag or something, but they're going to get an exact reading as precisely as they can at the final firing position. And they'll write that down in a notebook, whatever that uh, wind speed was. Then they'll make observations through the optics at the uh, target location. And they'll uh, look for maybe vegetation or they'll uh, focus in on the target and look at the mirage around the target. And they'll use that to get uh, an estimation of the wind at the target, direction and speed, right? So they're going to do their best to go ahead and estimate the wind speed and direction at the target. They'll write that down in the notebook. Okay, so now you have uh, wind at the final firing position and the wind at the target. A lot of times they'll uh, vary a little bit, so you'll have a, a different number. And then what what a lot of shooters will do is they'll look downrange, usually about halfways at midpoint or maybe a little bit past midpoint, 
and uh, they'll focus in on a bush or something or some, a piece of grass or whatever, and then they'll uh, again focus out like we said before. They'll look at the target again, but they're focused in at uh, mid-range. So when they're looking at the target, the, the, the focus is on the, the piece of atmosphere at mid-range. So they're getting they're perfectly in focus with the mirage coming off the ground at 50% of the range. And so now they get a wind reading at mid-range by using mirage. Like we said before, mirage is the primary means by which long-range shooters will determine wind speed and direction. That's the best way to do it. So now they have three readings. They have a wind, a very precise wind reading from the final firing position. They'll have one at the target that they've determined with Mirage, and they'll have one at midpoint with Mirage. And also they use other observations as well to confirm that. They'll take those three, they'll add them up, and they'll divide it by three. So they're uh, averaging out the three different readings to get their final overall windage, okay? And uh, that's a pretty good way to actually approach this. But there are some things that they're not considering. So let's say they go ahead and they get everything figured out with the wind. It's like a 12-mile-an-hour crosswind or whatever, and uh, they get it figured out. They average out the three uh, ranges or the, the three wind speeds, and they go ahead and they take a shot. And they notice that, oh, man, the, the, the wind deflection was a lot more than they had calculated for. And then so they're wondering, well, why did we miss by so much, you know? Uh, like, did we miscalculate the actual wind speed? What's going on here? Uh, one thing that a lot of people forget about is the shape of the trajectory curve. You'll notice that uh, sometimes when you're shooting extreme range, the max ordinate, the high point in the trajectory, can be very, very high. Like uh, at our one-mile uh, shoot that we did, our max ordinate was about 37 feet above the line of sight. So uh, about 60% downrange when we got there, the bullet was almost 40 feet over the line of sight. And uh, if this was flat ground even, 40 feet in the air, you're going to have a completely different wind speed than uh, you do at the ground. So the, the ground, you really got to consider, again, the shape of the trajectory going through different wind speed zones, kind of like we talked about in barometric pressure, except this one's really going to throw you uh, so you got to, the way that uh, a shooter can account for this is uh, you can get actual mirage readings above the ground at the max ordinate. Now what we're going to do is we're going to set up our ballistics uh, tables. We're going to have primary functions and secondary functions. And in the secondary functions table, it will give us our max ordinate for different ranges. Okay. So it'll tell you uh, at what range. For, you know, for a certain shot, what your max ordinate will be, how high above the line of sight, and how far down range that ordinate will occur. And that's important information for a lot of things. If you're shooting uh, under obstacles or if you're shooting through a uh, forest or, or the nature of your target, who, who knows what's going to be going on in, in your uh, area of operations. But in urban in environments or something, you're shooting under a bridge, uh, who knows what kind of uh, angle of fire you're going to have going on at the descending branch part of your trajectory so max ordinate and, and that information is pretty critical to have at your fingertips when you're out there actually being deployed but uh max ordinate is very important for this so what we're going to do is we're going to focus in uh we're going to look at our secondary functions table we're going to see where our max ordinate was so we're going to zoom in on an object on the ground uh below the max ordinate okay and we're going we're gonna to focus in on that object. Let's say there's a bush or a piece of grass or whatever. You're going to get a nice sharp image with your spotting scope. Then you're going to simply pan up to uh, the approximate height that your max ordinate would be. So you'd look 40 feet in the air above that and try to get a mirage reading up there. Now, this is going to be more difficult than, it's, than it is to pick up a mirage reading against the ground. For obvious reasons, the, your temperature difference between the ground and the... Uh, the atmosphere immediately above it can make the mirage a lot easier to see sometimes, more pronounced. Uh, so when you're looking up in the sky, you don't really have a, a background either. Sometimes it's hard to, to distinguish if you just got a clear blue sky or a white uh, background. It's going to be harder to see the mirage up in the air. So sometimes if you do have uh, large hills in the area or mountains or something, uh, you will see mirage possibly up in there. It's, sometimes it's difficult to get a mirage rating up there, but if it's at... If, at all possible to do it. I would strongly recommend taking your uh, middle reading at the actual point in the trajectory 
where your bullet's actually going to be flying rather than at the surface, uh, especially if you got any kind of wind patterns going on here. Because, uh, and the reason for this uh, wind uh, variation too is you have friction at the ground, right? And the friction at the ground, you're going to have various objects. You're going to have bushes, trees, hills, topography changes, buildings, whatever uh, that, that's on the ground is going to cause friction. It's going to reduce the wind at the ground. Normally, anywhere else you go, the higher you go, the higher the wind gets because they're further away from the friction you have. So uh, your, your airflow is going to be greater at higher altitude. And uh, for medium range shots, this isn't going to be as big of a deal. Like if you're shooting 600 meters or whatever, you, your max ordinate will be higher, but it's not going to be like dramatically higher. But once you start talking extreme range, uh, you're talking like uh, 40 feet over the, the line of sight. That's enough to where your wind speed at that, that height is going to be dramatically different than at the ground level a lot of times. So you're going to want to get your three readings still. And if the more readings you can get, the better. If you have more time in your final firing position before the target prevents itself to get really detailed wind readings, uh, go ahead and log that stuff and come up. Uh, the more the more wind logging you do, the better it's going to be when it's time to take the shot because you'll have a real good intimate understanding of the wind patterns in that area. And this whole effect can really be amplified and com complicated even more when you're talking about rugged terrain like we talked about before. So let's take a look at Windy Mountain here. No, not Misty Mountain, but Windy Mountain. So I'll uh, zoom in here, and we got our firing position on the ridge to the left, and we're shooting across a big valley uh, to take out a target on the, the ridge on the right there, okay? Now, these shots are quite common, uh, especially if you're operating in rugged terrain. Uh, so let's see. Let's say that the, the shot is actually perfectly even. You're not going to have to account for any angle of fire corrections. The target's at the same level you are. So here's our line of sight. Here's the direction our bore is going to be pointed. And there's the basic shape of our trajectory, okay? So let's say that a guy go, went ahead and uh, did an observation of the mirage at the target and uh, determined the wind speed there and then also determined the wind speed at the final firing position and the wind direction. And, and uh, they, they looked at the bottom of the valley to get their midway point for the, for the wind velocity. And they used that information to average out their wind speed and direction and they applied that to their optic, and they took a shot. And they missed by a huge amount. What's going on here? Same thing we are just talking about before. Uh, this uh, effect where you have wind increases above the ground is magnified when you have, like, a canyon sometimes because you're going to have wind whistling through a canyon. Sometimes it uh, gets funneled through a narrow spot. You have a huge mass of air going between some mountains, and when it gets crammed into a valley... In order for that same volume of air to make it to the other side, your velocity in the narrow part has to increase dramatically. That's why wind whistles through canyons. It's like a like the nozzle on the end of your hose. You uh, decrease the amount of area the same amount of water has to go through, and in order to make it through in the same amount of time, it has to be going way faster. So valleys really, really cause a constriction that um, increases your wind speed. So you're gonna have you might have wind just really tunneling through this valley in with an extreme velocity and you're not going to be able to detect it at your firing position because again you're protected by the ground the, the friction against the ground is going to cause the wind speed to be a lot more mild at your position so you can get all the anemometer ratings you want at your position and you're going to have no clue what kind of wind you got whistling through that valley likewise at the target you can make observations of the grass around the target you could have a flag sitting right there you could have smoke coming out of whatever and uh your, your wind speed at your target is going to be dramatically different usually than the wind going through the middle part of the valley above the ground, especially when you consider the shape of your trajectory. It doesn't even take that much of a valley. It doesn't have to be a mountain. It can be gently rolling hills, just shooting across a real gently rolling hills valley. Uh, you got to consider your line of sight is already above the floor of the valley considerably, and then your trajectory raises it even more, so you're really, really high above the actual ground. In some cases, you'll be shooting hundreds of feet over the ground, and that's uh, an altitude or uh, a height above the ground that can really have strong wind, wind speeds going on. And uh, th here's probably a more accurate representation of your uh, wind patterns, but you're going to have the low wind, against the actual surface of the earth that's going to be slowed down by friction and the higher you go and the further away you get from all your uh, friction areas you're going to have higher wind and then at the higher altitudes you're going to have even higher winds so you must consider 
uh, if you look at this picture here, you can see the trajectory goes right through that higher wind region. So that's going to have a huge effect on your bullet flight. So again, you're going to want to probably, in this case, focus in on something at the midpoint in the valley on the ground. And then uh, with, with your optic, you're going to focus in your scope on a certain object down there. And then just pan up above the line of sight uh, to wherever your max ordinance is going to be. And you're going to want to look that up and get a pretty good idea. And then try to get a mirage reading, if it's possible, up there at the max ordinate. And... Uh, that will give you a lot better idea of the wind. Then you can factor that in. You can average that in. And usually you'll see that the wind is a lot higher up there. So hopefully this real brief crash course into uh, correcting for wind gave you a lot better of idea of all the different uh, things to expect when you're doing long range shots. Now again, we're going to get into this in a little more detail when we actually start putting together our wind correction tables in our, our tables part of the video. And that'll be at the end of all the ballistic stuff. But uh, first we have to introduce you to the concepts so that we're gonna know how to uh, check our tables and put them together. And uh, so this very, very important information, like I said before, the wind is gonna be the hardest part to correct for. It's almost always constantly changing and it's extremely difficult to read sometimes. And it takes a lot of experience just getting used to making the call on uh, just based on your observations of what kind of wind you're looking at so uh don't be disheartened if you if you start getting into this long range stuff and you're missing because of wind uh that's quite common that's usually the thing that throws you off and we'll explain in full detail uh how a spotter would actually uh watch the wind and make the wind call and decide when to shoot and uh, everything like that so there's a lot that goes into, into making those judgments but we'll discuss that more later on but for now, we're just uh, discussing the mechanics of it. So this next oh, video we're going to get into is about angle of fire corrections. And that's relatively straightforward, so that shouldn't take too long. So uh, stick around for that one.